Good evening, distinguished virtual participants. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome to India House the head of the Indian Diplomatic Service, Foreign Secretary Mr. Harshvardhan Shringla, on his first official visit to the UK. His visit is at a key juncture when India and the UK are on the cusp of a new post-COVID, post-Brexit era. We are consulting on a new roadmap for the way forward towards our common goals. The roadmap, of course, is guided by the shared vision of our two honorable prime ministers who have identified our common reprioritized agenda to realize the aspirations of our two peoples and also for a better world. It is, of course, a turning point in the history of the UK as it develops a global Britain policy. And we are aware that the UK government is currently engaged in an internal integrated review, including of its foreign and trade policy. And India too is at a crucial juncture. The words of Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modiji on October 29th, a few days ago, come to my mind and I quote, so what if we could not move at the desired pace this year due to the pandemic? We will try and run faster in the next year to make up for the loss. Nothing great ever gets done if we are deterred by obstacles in our path. By not aspiring, we guarantee failure. India is the third largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity. We want India to become the third largest in terms of current US dollar prices as well. The five trillion target will help us achieve that, unquote. As an envoy of India and the UK, I'm greatly enthused that key advisors to the Honorable Prime Minister of the UK, who are advising him in the process, the integrated review process, would like to see relations with India move to a transformative phase, result-oriented, more consultative on issues of common interest, and collaborative in international fora as we seek to safeguard and strengthen multilateralism. In order to inform and involve friends and well-wishers of India as we progress along the milestones, High Commission of India, in partnership with India Inc., has the pleasure to relaunch Global Dialogue Series fittingly with a conversation with Foreign Secretary Mr. Harshvardhan Shringla on global India, self-reliant India, opportunities in a new world order. With these words, I give you Foreign Secretary Mr. Harshvardhan Shringla in conversation with Sri Manoj, Manoj Ladva. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, uh, High Commissioner, for those uh, uh, words. And thank you everyone for tuning in to what promises to be an insightful session where we will hear from India's senior most diplomat sharing his perspectives on various facets of India's foreign policy in these uh, challenging times. And in particular, India's relationship with the United Kingdom. Foreign Secretary, welcome. And thank you ever so much for uh, sparing the time this afternoon. I know you've had a, a very hectic and uh, schedule uh, uh, over the past few days. Uh, but we've received quite a few questions by video and there's been a tremendous amount of interest uh, in your visit here uh, to the UK. So welcome once again and it's uh, great to have you with us here. Um, Foreign Secretary, I'm going to uh, start off by asking a question which I'm sure is on the minds of everybody uh, watching here this afternoon. Uh, and I guess in many ways you've had the best possible vantage point in being uh, India's uh, ambassador to Washington uh, until you took over this job. So the question I have is um, simply, what do you make of the US presidential elections? Well, uh, Manoji, let me start by um, saying how delighted I am to be here in London, uh, in the UK. Um, I want to thank you for hosting this uh, show. Um, we last met in Washington, D.C. We had spoken about a lot of plans. 
and uh, it's wonderful to see you uh, in your element uh, in your city of London. Um, I also want to thank uh, the High Commissioner for her remarks and for um, arranging what has been a, a very, very comprehensive program in the UK at very short notice. Um, we were all um, quite preoccupied uh, last night with the US elections. Uh, we still haven't seen uh, the end game in the elections. Uh, it's uh, uh, as we um, watched television before coming down, uh, it wasn't clear to us as to who would emerge uh, from this contest as the next president of the United States. Uh, clearly, it's a very close contest, uh, and um, I think uh, there's some more excitement in store for us before we get the final result. Um, as far as we are concerned, uh, you know, uh, we do believe that uh, our relationship with the United States has come a long way. Uh, today, we have uh, what we call a comprehensive global strategic partnership. Our two countries cooperate across the board on a wide range of issues relating, starting from defense and security, going into technology and innovation, trade and investments, and of course, people to people contacts. Um, we um, have definitely crossed that tipping point in which the relations could be affected one way or the other. Uh, we do believe that irrespective of the political dispensation uh, in power in Washington or in New Delhi, uh, our relations with the United States will continue to be uh, strong and robust, even stronger and even more robust as we go along. Um, we, um, you know, in, in DC, um, I have had, uh, I have sort of worked uh, both sides of the political divide. Uh, I have found extraordinary bipartisan support for what we do. Yes, and, and that's what, sorry, uh, sorry, Foreign Secretary, that, that's, that's something that's been apparent over the last uh, few weeks and months that um, uh, both sides of the um, uh, divide have been uh, extremely keen um, to engage both the Indian diaspora but also um, reflect on the relationship with India. And so um, that, that's been a striking observation for many of us, uh, uh, this side of the uh, pond as well. And uh, I do want to bring you um, to this side of uh, uh, the pond. And um, th this has been uh, quite a hectic visit. You've visited three uh, major European capitals, Paris, Berlin, and uh, London. and. Forgive me for asking this, but um, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Um, the results of the US elections are not quite uh, known yet. And um, the Brexit negotiations are still on. So I guess the question is, um, why now, Foreign Secretary? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm visiting in unusual circumstances. Uh, we are dealing with the COVID crisis both in India and in Europe. Um, I haven't uh, been out of India except within our neighborhood uh, uh, since, um, uh, you know, we did, we started dealing with the pandemic. Um, but New Delhi felt that this is an opportune time to come down because it was important for us uh, to touch base with our principal interlocutors. Um, with the United States, we had three important engagements in the month of October, culminating in the two plus two ministerial. But we felt that engaging with Europe is very important. and. Uh, uh, so I visited our three main partners in Europe. Um, um, there's no substitute for direct contact. We've been speaking to each other. I've spoken to my counterparts in all countries uh, virtually. Uh, it's not the same thing as coming down here. Um, uh, thanks to High Commissioner um, Gayatri Kumar, we've had an extraordinary program meeting people across the board. We've met uh, policymakers, politicians, uh, members of the Indian community, members of uh, Parliament, uh, we met uh, our counterparts in the Foreign Office, uh, but also the Prime Minister's Office. So it's, it's been quite a, a wide range mm -hmm. of uh, contacts that we have had. Uh, it gives us, a, gave me an opportunity to articulate uh, how we see, uh, you know, the geopolitical situation in the wake of the COVID crisis, uh, sort of changed thinking both within India and our region. Um, Post-Brexit gives us uh, an extraordinary opportunity to reset our ties with the UK to see how we can recalibrate our institutional uh, cooperation uh, and uh, and seek uh, what uh, our prime ministers uh, see as a transformative relationship. And there's no reason why we can't do that. UK uh, is a country uh, with whom we have uh, strong historical ties, but also a country uh, that uh, in terms of economy provides us with complement com complementarities that we don't, uh, that we um, may not always get elsewhere. We also have a tremendous advantage that we have 
uh, a vibrant uh, community of Indian origin here and British nationals, but mm. uh, who are, have the ability to to be what our prime ministers described as a living bridge between our two countries. And uh, you exemplify that, uh, you know, uh, you are committed to a strong relationship. Um, uh, we uh, see that there are, um, yesterday I called on the Honorable Home Secretary, uh, again, a charismatic leader, very committed to the relationship. I met uh, Lord Tariq Ahmed at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, today we met um, uh, Lord Popert and Lord uh, Rami Ranger. Uh, Ranger. Uh, we met uh, Lord Karan Billy Moria. I mean, I'm just saying that we have come across many uh, stalwarts in the community who are, were committed to uh, getting the relationship into a fast gear and a fast track. And uh, all we need to do is to work with with this uh, uh, with the community uh, in order to uh, get things moving. Uh, indeed, yeah. indeed. And um, um, you um, rightly talk of both the living bridge but also the, um, the strength that that brings to the relationship. And uh, I want to now bring us to uh, the topic of strength uh, and a phrase that uh, Prime Minister Modi has recently used of uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat, that uh, quest for a self-resilient uh, India. And uh, forgive me for asking this, but um, a lot of people have been concerned as to how one reconciles this strident self-resilient agenda uh, on the one side and the more global, more open, more liberalized Indian narrative that uh, Prime Minister Modi has uh, worked on so hard uh, since coming to office in 2014. So how does one, you know, sitting here in, uh, in London, uh, either as an investor or in um, policy, reconcile the two? Well, the policy of Atma Nirbharta or self-reliance has to be seen in the context of the COVID crisis. Uh, this has been the worst crisis that has uh, afflicted mankind since the Second World War. Uh, we haven't yet uh, fully understood the extent and the dimensions of this crisis, uh, not only in terms of uh, uh, the loss of, uh, uh, you know, uh, human loss of our citizens, but also in terms of uh, the economic uh, impact of this crisis. Um, and in that context, I think the Prime Minister, what he, he um, uh, enunciated was a policy that would enable us to gain confidence, that would uh, enable us to create the capacities, uh, that would enable us to not only help ourselves, but help other countries in the world. Um, I'll give you an example. As soon as we um, entered into the crisis, we found that we were um, uh, uh, short of uh, the very uh, health-related equipment that we should have had to deal with this sort of crisis, PPEs, masks, test kits, ventilators. Uh, we had to scramble to source these from different parts of the world. But what we did was we, uh, there is a certain uh, resilience uh, within our, uh, uh, within us, which uh, made us, uh, uh, let's say, innovate. Um, automobile manufacturers were asked to manufacture ventilators. Uh, many of our companies uh, ramped up their production of these items and I'm happy to say today under the Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, program uh, we are not only producing enough of these uh, uh, health related equipment for ourselves but we are able to provide these to countries all over the world. Um, but just to give you an example when we started uh, with COVID-19 um, we had 16,000 ventilators in hospitals in India. We now propose to have 500,000 ventilators in hospitals. So we have ramped up the uh, ability of our health system to deal with crises of this nature. So when you talk about Atmanirbhar Bharat, it really means having the capacity uh, to deal with this, not only to deal with it yourself, but to produce enough for the rest of the world. You will recall that uh, when we first again um, had the situation, um, there was a concern that we uh, could be short of medicines. Uh, we are considered to be the pharmacy of the world. India supplies medicines to countries all over the world. There was a huge demand for medicines like hydroxychloroquine, which uh, many countries felt was uh, the cure uh, for COVID-19. Um, we um, ensured that, uh, again, production was increased, that we um, had sources of API, and that uh, we were able to um, uh, provide these medicines to over 150 countries and half of them, at, at least half of them on cost or on gratis basis. Well, the UK is a great example of uh, um, of the supply of this basic medicine, paracetamol. 95% of all paracetamol in this country comes from India. And it was only um, during COVID that we actually realized 
the dependency uh, on India for this very basic medicine. And I guess it underlined how India is the uh, pharmacy of the world and highlighted that uh, to the rest of uh, the world. So um, COVID has highlighted a lot of uh, amazing strengths um, uh, about India, which perhaps the rest of the world weren't always as conscious of. And um, the way in which you've described Atmanirbhar Bharat, or self-reliant Bharat, is, I guess, uh, more about integrating, being India being prepared in a way where it can fully integrate into the global supply chains as well, which, uh, which is something, a conversation that uh, many people have been uh, having over the last few weeks, that exactly how that would run out. Um, Foreign Secretary, I, I want to now uh, turn to some of our guests who would have otherwise been here and uh, wanted to meet you in uh, person and um, discuss uh, various um, aspects of India's foreign policy in you, person. You, Sorry. Can I just uh, complete my, uh, you know, uh, train of thoughts uh, on the issue of Atmanirbhar? Yes, please. You see, one of the important areas that we uh, have uh, um, uh, collaboration going with the UK is in the vaccine development. Indeed. As uh, you know, uh, India produces 60% of the world's vaccines. Um, at this point, we have three candidate vaccines, uh, and one of which is a collaboration between uh, um, a Serum Institute and uh, AstraZeneca of Oxford. And that's an important part of the collaboration with the UK. Uh, in vaccines, we are part of the Gavi Alliance. Our Prime Minister spoke at the uh, Gavi Summit uh, that was organized by Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Um, now, when it comes to vaccine, our Prime Minister has stated in the UN uh, that India will provide, make vaccines accessible at affordable rates to the entire world. In other words, we will be at the forefront of providing vaccines. Uh, that's that's uh, a, a very um, generous statement, uh, considering that uh, a lot of countries are um, clamoring for the vaccine, uh, but it is in keeping with our concept of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is one family, it's an ancient uh, concept, but uh, the philosophy remains uh, valid today. What we are trying to do is to ensure that we have enough capacity production to be able to meet the requirements not only of our population, beginning of course with vulnerable sections, but also to tie up with our neighbors, with, with other uh, developing countries and partners to ensure that this goes across. Uh, we've already uh, you know, uh, uh, started discussing human trials with our neighbors. And I think uh, it's important uh, that uh, at a time of a crisis of this nature, in keeping with our Prime Minister's vision, uh, we share what we have. We don't become inward looking. Mm. On the contrary, Atma Nirvata means we become more giving, more sharing. But for that, we need the capacity, we need the confidence, and we need the ability to be able to go out and help others. Thank you very much, Foreign Secretary. That was, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that you, you raised the issue of uh, vaccines, and I can only imagine the huge challenge going forwards. One is, of course, in getting the vaccine, and then uh, the logistical challenge of getting it around uh, the wor uh, world. But that, again, underlines um, India's intent to be fully integrated into the global uh, supply chain. And uh, uh, I think everybody has their fingers crossed and looking forward to some great news uh, very, very soon as well. Um, I'd like, I would now like to turn to uh, Lord uh, Jitesh Kadia, who is a board member of UK government investments uh, for his question. Good afternoon and a warm welcome Foreign Secretary to the United Kingdom. We are delighted to see you here and hope you have productive discussions to advance the unique partnership between the UK and India. As you know, the Indian diaspora in this country numbers over 1.5 million people and makes an outsized contribution to all walks of British life. It has appropriately been called the living bridge by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, a metaphor for the two-way traffic in people, language, sport, culture and commerce between our two countries. We saw the power of this connect when Prime Minister Modi packed out Wembley Stadium during his 2015 visit to the UK. Whilst the Government of India has done much to harness the potential of the global Indian diaspora, many of us feel that this X factor in our bilateral relationship is still underutilised. So my question to you is, how can India, and indeed the UK, properly harness the potential of having such an important and vibrant living bridge between our two nations. Well, thank you, Lord Gaudia. I think that's a very relevant question. Um, 
Um, I can give you the analogy of the United States where I was there, as Manoji said a short while ago. Um, we were together in uh, Houston where we saw the Indian community welcoming uh, the Prime Minister um, in the Howdy Modi show. Uh, you can imagine uh, 50,000 or more um, uh, US citizens of Indian origin um, had filled that stadium. Uh, it was an incredible sight, uh, an incredible sense of confidence uh, watched by each and every individual back at home in India. Um, and uh, it was a great moment for all of us. And what does it imply? It means that the Indian, uh, the community of Indian origin in the United States has that puts, put its efforts behind uh, a strong India-US relationship. I've always relied on the community in the US to, to deliver on issues that were very important to us. And I have no doubt uh, that our High Commissioner, um, uh, Mrs. Gayatri Kumar, is doing the same thing in London. Uh, I think we have an extraordinary community of Indian origin here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we, uh, you know, have um, not only four um, uh, ministers in the current cabinet of Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, but we also have uh, an extraordinary range of people who uh, are in all walks of life in business, in commerce, uh, industry, uh, government, civil service. Um, and I think um, it's a great advantage for us uh, if we would um, need to use that potential. Uh, I, use, I mean that in a positive sense of the term. Um, the Indian community has an advantage of knowing both sides, um, you know, knowing the UK, knowing India. Uh, we are looking at uh, technology innovations. We're looking at supporting startups. We're looking at uh, financing proposals. I think there is no better um, link for this uh, than uh, the living bridge that Lord Gardia described uh, in securing for us uh, the objectives yes. of a transformative uh, Indo-UK partnership. Yes, and he also used the uh, phrase, the X factor, which I thought was a, a great phrase to use uh, as well in describing the diaspora. Um, the second question we have uh, from another eminent um, person of Indian origin is Baroness Usha Prashar. She is the chair of uh, FIKI, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry here in the UK. Baroness Prashar. Hello, Foreign Secretary, and a very warm welcome. My question is about education. The new education policy was announced by the Government of India in July this year, and it is indeed visionary and impressive. Rightly, its aim is to make the education system more contemporary and skills orientated. But what steps are you taking to make it a reality? And what kind of collaborations and partnerships are you seeking with the further and higher education institutions in the UK? Uh, thank you, Baroness Prashad. Um, that's a very relevant question in today's context. Uh, you're aware that uh, we have 65% uh, of our population is below 35 years of age. We have a young, we are a young country, uh, but it also means we're an aspirational country. We have to provide uh, for a million people who come into the job market every month. Uh, there is a lot of importance given to skills development, uh, to building capacities of our younger people and our youth. Uh, in that context, a new education policy that reflects contemporary realities that, is, uh, that provides for um, you know, uh, modes of education that are increasingly, I think, uh, possible due to, due to uh, enhanced communication, use of the internet, uh, extensive, uh, um, let's say, internet availability in India due to uh, the Digital India Program for Prime Minister. Uh, in that context, I think a new education policy is uh, one that uh, would certainly find, uh, um, enable our youth to find their place uh, in the 21st century. One of the very important aspects of this, which is very relevant to uh, audiences abroad, uh, is uh, uh, the, uh, that for the first time we are allowing uh, foreign universities to set up campuses in India, to have collaborations uh, uh, in India. Uh, you asked uh, what is the operational objectives. I think one of them is to have the top 100 universities uh, uh, come into India. I think here there's a great advantage, a uh, great possibility for Indo-UK cooperation. Uh, some of the best universities and centers and institutes of higher education are in the UK. A lot of Indian students come here to, uh, to uh, uh, let's say, for uh, higher education and, and to, to uh, gain knowledge. Uh, I think uh, much of this can and can actually now um, be um, provided through collaborations and, and uh, tie-ups uh, with uh, educational institutions uh, in the UK. It also fosters greater R&D uh, research, uh, greater uh, exchanges uh, between faculty 
And I think, um, you know, we've opened up uh, a, a new uh, realm of possibility in the education sector. Our ambition is to become uh, the superpower of education. It's not, uh, uh, not a very, um, uh, I would say, far-fetched uh, idea considering that, uh, that uh, we are such a young nation and uh, we have the potentials to do that. And uh, we look forward to working with, with all concerned, particularly well, the Indian diaspora uh, in the UK and the US and other countries in realizing the vision of a new education policy. Well, with that vision, I can uh, also visualize uh, um, in the not too distant future, uh, long, long queues of students uh, uh, clamoring for Indian visas to come and study uh, in India uh, as well. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, and again, something that uh, many people have said to me that this was a, uh, a reform that was much needed and um, it hold, uh, holds a lot of uh, opportunity for uh, the future as well. Now, uh, moving on to the next uh, prominent uh, person of Indian origin and somebody who heads up uh, the Confederation of British Industry, the president of the Confederation of British Industry, uh, Lord uh, Karan Billy Moria. Foreign Secretary, it's great to have you here in the UK with us. As the founding chair of the UK India Business Council, chairman of Cobra Beer and president of the Confederation of British Industry, I've been a great believer in the potential of trade business between the UK and India. At the moment, we're just scratching the surface. What are your views on the future potential of a free trade deal between the UK and India in the near future? And linked to that, the increase in mobility from a business point of view, students, academics and tourists between our two great countries. Thank you. Lord Billimori, and it's good to see you again. Uh, met last evening. Um, from our perspective, uh, I think uh, trade and investments uh, are uh, low-hanging fruits. Uh, uh, we are at about $15 billion of bilateral trade. Uh, the potential is far greater. Um, I believe uh, both our sides are working uh, to develop uh, institutional arrangements that could uh, provide uh, significant momentum to our trade uh, and investment ties. We've just had the JETCO meeting. Uh, our minister has uh, just had uh, his uh, interaction. Commerce minister has interaction with his counterpart here. Uh, we are looking at uh, a free trade agreement or a preferential trade agreement uh, with uh, a, a sort of an early harvest uh, um, limited agreement that can uh, bring quick benefits to businesses in both our countries. Um, subsequently, we will uh, enter into negotiations for a, a free trade agreement or a preferential trade agreement, and I think this is uh, a win-win situation for both countries. Uh, we also have uh, the proposal on the table for a uh, mobility uh, and migration agreement, which is essentially designed to ensure that there is flexibility in the uh, in the movement of professionals, uh, um, uh, the UK could need, uh, say, health professionals. You might need uh, professionals in the IT sector. You might need people in the aviation sector. I'm just giving you examples. We could need professionals from here. Uh, it enables the movement of professionals in an organized manner without uh, the, uh, let's say, implications of uh, residency, uh, a long-term uh, settlement uh, in the UK. Uh, it will cut into uh, illegal immigration, uh, which is uh, currently a concern uh, mm. with the Home Department. Uh, and I think on the whole, uh, will give us uh, uh, significant advantages uh, in uh, our businesses, because many of our businesses also rely on uh, ensure and getting um, a, a sort of a professional manpower availability. Uh, I think uh, some of these ideas can take our two countries significantly forward. But as I said, I want to make it clear that these are only ideas. These are concepts. Uh, these are uh, on our drawing board. And uh, we are currently working on a, on a blueprint, uh, what we call a Roadmap 360, uh, uh, that would uh, define uh, India-UK cooperation over the next dec decade or two. So it's, it's a long-term plan. But I think we need to bring in uh, an institutional framework uh, that would provide for uh, a very, very uh, uh, strong uh, partnership and trade yeah. and investment. This is um, quite encouraging because uh, for, for a 
some time now, as you may know, I've been uh, saying that we should stop talking about a special relationship between the UK and India, because there already exists one, but talk more in terms of the depth and breadth of the relationship. And some of the things that you've mentioned here uh, really strike at the heart of uh, a really strong strategic co um, uh, cooperation between the two countries, and it's quite encouraging. But I do want to probe you a little bit, and uh, Commerce Minister Goyal has been quite vocal uh, over the last few months uh, um, he, in relation to a early harvest agreement. And uh, my question is uh, around timescales. Uh, do you have any indication of when an early harvest agreement could be possible between the UK and India? And if there are any particular stumbling blocks that you think that um, uh, need to be removed? Well, uh, you know, uh, my um, sense is that what uh, when we talk about an early harvest, we're looking at those items uh, on the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, on the trade list that um, uh, neither side has any encumbrances on. In other words, there are no domestic issues linked to uh, those items. Um, there are no sensitivities in either country. And if you can identify a certain number of those items, which I'm sure both countries can, um, then uh, we have the makings uh, of uh, uh, this uh, early harvest uh, agreement that can bring, as I said, quick benefits. Um, but uh, in terms of time frame, that is difficult to say because uh, that depends on the negotiators. Uh, the fact that our commerce and industry minister himself is engaged, so the trade minister from your side indicates the importance that we attach to it. Uh, we, are, we have a schedule of visits. Uh, we are looking forward to the visit of uh, Foreign Secretary Dominic Trump to India in December. Um, when our Prime Minister spoke uh, to Prime Minister Johnson uh, in March this year, just before the lockdown, he invited him to visit India. Of course, uh, the you know, COVID-19 intervened, um, but at some stage uh, and through mutually agreed channels, we uh, would work out uh, the possibilities of a visit uh, at the summit level. Uh, and uh, in, in all of these visits, we need to ensure that we are working very steadily towards those goals and objectives that Lord Billy Moria and our other uh, interlocutors uh, just spoke about. So in summary, uh, a very firm watch this space uh, is the answer. Absolutely. To, uh, you have to look to High Commissioner <laughs> Gayatri Kumar <laughs> for delivery in that yes. regard. Uh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm now going to turn to um, uh, Louise Donaghy. Uh, she's the Senior Vice President uh, for India at uh, uh, Rolls-Royce, which is one of uh, the UK's leading uh, uh, listed companies. Louise. Thank you, Minaj. Foreign Secretary, welcome to the UK. As you may know, Rolls-Royce has been in India for many decades, and we are proud to provide the power to protect to the Indian Air Force and the Indian Navy. In 2015, Prime Minister Modi and David Cameron signed an agreement for our nations to co-develop defence technology. At Rolls-Royce, we'd like to see this aspiration become reality and develop new jet engine technology with India. How do you see the opportunities for British companies like ourselves to partner with India to truly realise the aspiration of self-reliance in defence for India? Well, thank you. Uh, Rolls-Royce has been a very important interlocutor, has been a very active participant uh, in, in our industrial development, uh, uh, both on the civil side and the defense side. Um, I, I certainly see a lot of potentials in the development uh, of an engine um, jointly with Rolls-Royce because we are looking at enormous and exponential growth uh, in sectors that we're talking about, uh, in the aviation industry, um, in the defense industry. Um, uh, a lot of this is also uh, linked to our own priorities uh, to try and get uh, joint manufacturing, joint R&D, joint technology transfers, uh, jo I mean, work on, on technology jointly. And of course, uh, in that context, uh, it, it is also a part of not only our Make in India program, Prime Minister's Atmanirbhar program, and I think here uh, Rolls-Royce can certainly um, um, uh, do a, a great deal um, to fit into that program, uh, I do believe that, and this conversation was there earlier as well uh, when we met uh, representatives of industry, uh, that uh, this can also be uh, supplemented or supported by a G2G dialogue in which we can see how we can support industrial initiatives of this nature uh, reach their logical conclusion. Yes, and, and one of the 
um, facets of the, the trust between the UK uh, uh, and into the depth of that trust is in the 2015 uh, understanding between um, Prime Minister Cameron and Prime Minister Modi on the joint development of uh, intellectual property and technologies in the defence sector, which is something you don't see vis-à-vis uh, -vis other countries uh, as much. And I think um, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of scope, as you've said, uh, for collaboration there. Uh, as well. Um, we're going to hit the ball around the park a bit to use a, uh, a um, cricketing phrase and I'd like to call now upon uh, Lord Jonathan Marland who's the chair of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council. Good morning Minister and um, so nice to see you virtually uh, and of course we're so sorry not to be able to see you in the flesh. Uh, I hope your visit is going well. Most of us are yearning for the warmth of India at the moment when you've chosen the cold, wet the United Kingdom. Uh, as you know, the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council is a networking organisation bringing together business and trade from across the Commonwealth. We are successfully carrying out webinars every week, um, linking the Commonwealth in various business classes. Last week we had a webinar on uh, the legal profession. Uh, we've also had uh, in conversations with various heads of state and uh, leaders from in the Commonwealth. My question for you, Excellency, is it is probably fair to say that India has not fully embraced the Commonwealth opportunity uh, I think that uh, at times uh, you've been reluctant to grasp the opportunity. Indians are represented, represented through every Commonwealth country, uh, all 54 of them. It is a third of the world's population. Of course, your own country is the largest. But uh, my question to you is, why has India been reluctant? Is this now not the time when India can show real leadership as we as we come out of this covid crisis and people are looking to see how they can regenerate their economies and what can we do to help to uh, enable india to take up this uh, mantle so please uh, i apologize for my bluntness but uh, please um, uh, i would much enjoy to hear your response Foreign Secretary, I must add that uh, this is probably the first time ever that I've heard uh, Lord Marland apologise for his bluntness. <laughs> well, thank you, Lord Marland. Uh, the weather has been cool, but the welcome has been very, very warm, I can assure you, uh, in, in London and in the UK. Um, the Commonwealth has been a very, very important uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, uh, and um, one of the advantages of the Commonwealth is that uh, it also brings together countries uh, that range from small island states in the in the Pacific region uh, uh, to countries uh, in Africa, uh, and it gives you a platform in which uh, at one go you can reach out to a very large number of countries. Uh, so we appreciate uh, you know the, the Commonwealth's uh, grouping. We appreciate the opportunity that provides us. The Commonwealth Secretariat uh, is actively engaged in in, in uh, fostering uh, uh, cooperation among common, Commonwealth countries. Uh, we have a, had a program that uh, specifically uh, was focused on capacity building of uh, small island states uh, in the Commonwealth. Um, we had uh, allocated uh, uh, significant resources for that. Uh, there are many other programs that are linked to capacity building, that are linked to uh, training. And uh, business is one of those, uh, uh, I would say, spin-offs of the Commonwealth that we should be exploiting. I mean, if we are not doing that, we should be doing more. Uh, to ensure that uh, Commonwealth businesses come together, that we see opportunities through this uh, platform and the Commonwealth Business Chamber does provide those opportunities and we are more than happy to, uh, to see how we can work with the Chamber in achieving our larger and mutual objectives. Okay, good. Um, I'm now going to turn to uh, David Cornell, who's the Managing Director of uh, Avendis Capital. Sir, Foreign Minister. Good evening and a warm welcome to a wet and windy autumnal England. My name is David Cornell and I'm the Managing Director of Ocean Dial Asset Management, a UK business owned by Vendors Capital, a leading financial services company based in Mumbai. We provide equity exposure to India's economic opportunity for a wide range of investment institutions globally 
and we're passionate in our conviction that India represents the most exciting opportunity for global investors, particularly following a period of structural reform under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi. I'm also passionate about the role that the City of London can play in supporting India's future development. It is Europe's largest capital market and the preferred international listing venue for companies at all stages of growth and of all sizes. It is at the heart of global markets and not least because of its ongoing relationship with corporate India. To date, Indian companies have raised over $14 billion of equity capital on the London Stock Exchange, the largest amount of any Asian country. London is at the forefront of the internationalisation of the rupee through the issuance of masala bonds. And in terms of the number of Asian-based companies, it is only second to Japan in terms of the amount of debt finance that's been raised through the City of London. It is therefore the only real global bridge to fast growing economies, and there is none faster than India's. I expect and hope that it will remain at the centre of raising capital for India's development in the future as we look forward to, as we look forward to an exciting time ahead. Main London Main, Apka Swagat Kartohun. Both, both, Dhanavad, Shri Cornell. Um, I'm uh, we're very cognizant of the fact that uh, London is the financial capital of the world. Uh, I think um, we um, today have um, the opportunities to leverage financing from uh, the UK uh, at rates that are very competitive, um, and um, uh, some of it has already been um, uh, channelized and invested into India. Um, I, what I want to say is that uh, even during the COVID crisis, we have maintained the competitivity of our uh, economic uh, policies that will enable uh, increased investments, uh, enhanced uh, interest uh, in manufacturing and other activities in India, for which uh, financing is an important uh, uh, prerequisite. Um, there are three or four areas in which we have uh, sought uh, liberalization to liberalize our sectors. Uh, one of them is labor. As you know, there were 144 labor laws in India. We have codified them under four codes. In other words, it is much easier for an investor today to set up shop in India uh, and deal with labor than it was before. The regulatory framework is easier uh, and, and much less cumbersome. Uh, the second area is in the sector of mining and coal, where important reforms have taken place. The third is agriculture, uh, which has, uh, I think, uh, freed up the sector in terms of both production and uh, government procurement. Uh, um, and of course, uh, um, in the defense sector, where um, the um, foreign direct investments have uh, the rate has been increased from 49% to 74%, which means a foreign investor can take a 74% stake in the defense sector uh, manufacturing in India, which is significant. But what is most important for investors uh, like yourself, uh, Mr. Connell, is the fact that uh, our corporate taxation rate has come down uh, to 15%, which is one of the lowest in the world. Uh, and uh, this has produced results because, as our Prime Minister pointed out uh, in an interview the other day, um, foreign direct investments in, in, into India and for the period from April to August uh, 2020, which is the worst period of the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, um, uh, amounted to $35.73 billion, which is a 13% increase over the same period in the previous year when we didn't have COVID. Uh, so, um, I, I think investors are bullish in India. The environment clearly is uh, a continuing, uh, continuing to liberalize. And uh, uh, we have also, uh, in terms of the ease of doing business with India, you've seen we have come down from 49th, 149th position in the world uh, to a global position of something like 63. So, we continue to strive to make, it, uh, make uh, India a more competitive destination, one where investors can make sure that the returns are commensurate to their expectations and and we do recognize that UK in general and London in particular is an important stop in that regard.